Well, here it is, Christmas Day, a day for opening gifts, being with family, and remembering God's greatest gift. And today it is my privilege to bring you the final reading from Max Lucado's book, In the Manger. I hope you like this story. Ten-year-olds take Christmas gifts very seriously. At least we did in Mrs. Griffin's fourth grade class. The holiday gift exchange outranked the presidential election, NFL draft, and 4th of July parade. We knew the procedure well. On the day preceding Thanksgiving break, Mrs. Griffin would write each of our names on a piece of paper, dump the slips of paper into a baseball cap, and shake them up. One by one, we stepped up to her desk and withdrew the name of the person to whom we would give the gift. Under the Geneva Convention's Law of Gift Exchange, we were instructed to keep our identity a secret. Name disclosure was not permitted. We told no one for whom we were shopping, but we told everyone what we were wanting. How else would they know? We dropped hints like the Canadian winter drops snow, everywhere and every day. I made certain each classmate knew what I wanted. A six-finger! In 1965, all red-blooded American boys wanted a six-finger. We knew the slogan by heart. Six-finger, six-finger, man alive, how did I ever get along with five? The six-finger was more than a toy, yes siree, Bob. It could fire off a cap bomb, message missile, secret bullet, and SOS signal. Why, it even had a hidden ballpoint pen. Who could live without a six-finger? I couldn't, and I made certain the other 12 students in Mrs. Griffin's class knew it. But Carol wasn't listening. Little Carol with the pigtails, freckles, and shiny black shoes. Don't let her sweet appearance fool you. She broke my heart. For on the day of the great gift exchange, I ripped the wrapping paper off my box to find only stationery. You read the word right, stationary. Brown envelopes with folded note cards that bore a picture of a cowboy lassoing a horse. What 10-year-old boy uses stationary? There's a term for this type of gift, obligation. The required to give gift. The oops, I almost forgot to get you something gift. I could imagine the scene at little Carol's house on that fateful morning in 1965. She was eating breakfast. Her mother raised the question of the class Christmas party. Carol, are you supposed to take a gift to class? And Carol dropped her spoon in her Rice Krispies. I forgot I'm supposed to bring a gift for Max. For whom? For Max Lucado, my handsome classmate who excels in every sport and discipline and is utterly polite and humble in every way. And you're just telling me, Carol's mom asked. I forgot, but I know what he wants. He wants a six finger. A prosthetic? No, a six finger. Six finger, six, six finger, man alive. How did I ever get along with five? Carol's mom scoffs at the thought. Huh, six finger my Aunt Edna. She goes to the storage closet and begins rummaging through, well, rummage. She finds t paisley tube socks are sun-discarded and a dinosaur-shaped scented candle. She almost selects the box of big pins. But then she spies the stationery. Carol falls to her knees and pleads, Don't do it, Mom. Don't give him stationery with a little cowboy lassoing a horse. Forty-seven years from now, he'll describe this moment in the conclusion of a book. Do you really want to be memorialized as the one who gave an obligation gift? Bah, humbug, Carol's mom objected. Give him the stationery. That kid is destined for prison anyway. He'll have plenty of time to write letters there. And so she gave me the gift. And what did I do with it? The same thing you did with coffee cups fruit cake and orange and black sweaters and hand lotion from the funeral home and the calendar from the insurance company. What did I do with the stationery? I gave it away at the class party the next year. I know we shouldn't complain, but honestly, when somebody hands you a bar of hotel soap and says, this is for you, don't you detect a lack of originality? But when a person gives a genuine gift, don't you cherish the presence of affection, the hand-knit sweater, 
the photo album from last summer's events, the personalized poem. Such gifts convince you that somebody planned, prepared, saved, and searched. Last minute decision? No, this gift was just for you. Have you ever received such a gift? Yes, you have. Sorry to speak on your behalf, but I know the answer as I ask the question. You have been given a perfect personal gift, one just for you. There has been born for you a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. It's the greatest gift your life will ever know. An angel spoke these words. Shepherds heard them first. But what the angel said to them, God says to anyone who will listen, there has been born for you. Jesus is the gift. He himself is the treasure. Grace is precious because he is. Grace changes lives because he does. Grace secures us because he will. The gift is the giver. To discover grace is to discover God's utter devotion to you. Grace, let it, let him, so seep into the crusty cracks of your life that everything softens. Then let it, let him, bubble to the surface like a spring in the Sahara in words of kindness and deeds of generosity. God will change you. You are a trophy of his kindness, a partaker of his mission. Not perfect by any means, but closer to perfection than you've ever been. Because of Jesus. That's what happens when grace happens. May it happen to you this Christmas day. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the grace of Jesus revealed when he came to live with us, to love us, to die for us, and to rise again that we might have everlasting life, the greatest gift any of us will ever receive. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.